Hi, welcome. This video is going to be a brief introduction to the Minnesota Multi-Tiered System of Supports Framework, or MNMTSS. And this was released by the State Department of Education in the fall of 2021. And before we dig into these five colorful graphics and these phrases floating around this slide, the framework itself, I want you to look, please, at the, the students and the principals, teachers, and other educators in the center of the, the slide we're looking at, because we get a lot of frameworks and graphics and colorful things thrown at us as educators. And in order for it to really mean anything, it has to keep students and teachers and educators at the center of what we're trying to accomplish. Because as we go through these colorful symbols and these words, it should feel, if it's, if it's achieving what it's meant to, it should feel like common sense. And it should feel like, hey, this is going to help us be more on the same page, be more intentional about how we're continuously improving our school in service of students and the teachers and educators who support those students and each other. So students and teaching and learning and educators have to be at the center of everything I'm talking about in the rest of this video. So there are five pieces of Minnesota MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports. And I'm gonna start on the top left with infrastructure for continuous improvement. And I don't think there's a way to overstate how important this is because it is infrastructure. It's the foundation of success with everything else I'm gonna be talking about on this slide. Um, the nuts and bolts really have to be worked out for all these other things to achieve what they're meant to achieve and for us to actually do them. So a key piece of infrastructure in schools is teams. So if you've worked in schools, you know that there's grade level teams, department teams, leadership teams, district teams. There's all kinds of groups of educators meeting around tables and working together in schools. The key is to optimize that. And we use this phrase, work together like clockwork. That's the dream and the goal and what we aspire to. And how does a clock work? Well, there's variety of teams working, but what is the purpose of each and how do they fit together? How do they communicate with each other so that team A knows what team B is working on and that they don't duplicate that work? That's what we mean by working together like clockwork. Necessary resources have to be available. So we know the importance of effective curriculum that we're teaching or any other practice. It has to be an effective practice. Um, but we need schedules, master schedules, that allow us sufficient instructional time and sufficient space for supplementation or differentiation for students who need that. We need training on any curriculum or practice and then coaching because implementation doesn't happen. It's not an event. So we know that training P PD is just one small part of making anything happen and making it successful. Technology isn't listed there, but it's another example of resources that we need. We need technical systems, websites that we know how to use and that are easy to use so that they are easy to operate on a daily basis and give us the information we need when we need it. Um, implementation plans. So there's only so many projects and things that a school or a district can be working on at any given time and hope to be successful with them. So we really want to make things happen and make them stick so we get that bang for our buck. And that planning is essential to that. We have to be deliberate about what we're trying to do, um, pick things that are realistic to achieve, and then really work at it and optimize the, the curriculums, the schedules, the training, the coaching, the technology, the other resources in order to make those things happen. That leads me to database decision making. So if you've worked in schools, you know that there's an infinite amount of data that we could be looking at. And we there's quantitative data, universal screening data, formative assessment data, there's qualitative data. We can't, though, be walking down the hallway with a screen in front of our face, constantly be looking at data 24-7. So the, the key is to carve out and define who's going to be looking at data, what data are they going to be looking at, when, is it monthly, quarterly, um, three times a year, how often do, should we be looking at the data, and how do we look at it? Do we 
um, pull up visual charts of it? Do we look at raw numbers? Um, how do we pull meaning from that data and use it to be our compass when we're making important decisions? Not only about just individual students, but around whole grade levels or whole school practices or district-wide practices. So if we're doing this successfully, it should form into what feels like a routine. Um, because again, there's so much data that could be really overwhelming for us to process. So we, we want to refine this routine of when we're looking at data so that it feels manageable, but it's also effective. It's the data we want to be looking at and we keep coming back to it. So when we sit down and look at it, it does feel meaningful because we know what it means to us and how it informs which decisions. Assessment, that uh, bottom center of the image, um, is collecting much of that data, that assessment data. So we know that there's universal screening data, which gives us you know, that barometer on the entire student body and, and what students are learning. Um, it also helps us identify students who need supplemental extra support. There's progress monitoring data, so that recurring uh, reading on a single student and the progress that they're making and what they're learning. And then there's more sources of data. <laughs> there's a lot of assessment data, and it's just collecting that and being intentional with it. The top right of my screen, uh, family and community engagement. So this takes a lot of intentional communication between the school and the district and parents and families and the community to build up trust. Trust doesn't happen on its own. It, it takes that communication and knowing each other and building up those relationships in order for shared responsibility to be created and then maintained. So being accountable with each other to support students and to support everyone involved. So again, it takes a lot of deliberate communication um, to achieve family and community engagement and keep that equitable and feeling like a true partnership. Last but not least is the multi-layered practices and support. So we start here with tier one or the core, the, experience, the universal experience of school that all students receive. And that is truly the foundation because when we talk about these other pieces you see on here, tier two, tier three, special education, they're really just layers on top of our tier one, of our core, of that universal instruction and experience of the school that all students receive. So that has to be strong for any of these other added layers to be successful. And if our tier one isn't strong enough and isn't robust enough to meet the needs of the vast majority of students, the comprehensive needs of the vast majority of students, layering things on top of that won't be optimized, won't be successful. So it's, it's fundamentally important that our tier one, again, meets the comprehensive needs of the vast majority of students in our school. When we do layer extra support on top of that, um, it's, it's with an efficiency mindset. So tier two is that first added layer of support, and we say supplemental, it's a supplement. A phrase we use for tier two intervention sometimes is plug and play, because what we want is a, is a menu of options. So we know these math interventions are rapidly accessible. We know what they are. We know what we're giving students. We know the skills that these interventions are targeting. They're just really well defined. They're a menu that we have ready and waiting for students and for reading and for SEL as well in other areas, we have that menu of, of plug and play interventions which we can get students really quickly when we need to. And again, it's with that efficiency mindset. We don't wanna to have to reinvent the wheel for every single one of the students in our school who needs a little bit of extra support to close the gap. But there is a case and we do need a tier three and that is intensive. Other words that we associate with tier three interventions would be individualized. We start to tailor the intervention to the specific student. So that doesn't mean necessarily, in many cases, it doesn't mean the student's not receiving uh, instruction one-on-one -on -one with an educator. Um, they are likely receiving a program or instruction in a group of some size with other students. So when we say tailoring and individualizing, what we mean is that we're not, we're not giving the standard 
um, plug and play intervention to the student, we're adjusting it and tailoring it to them and making it stronger. That's what the intensification means. So it might be provided longer. Um, we might be targeting even more specific skills. We might be meeting with the student more often, more frequently. Um, so we're intensifying and tailoring and individualizing the intervention to what that student needs. And special education, really a great description for it is tier three on steroids because everything I just said, that in intensification, individualization, tailoring applies to special education. So it really is that, but it's on steroids. It's, it's different in really important ways from tier three that uh, any student might receive. Special education, students with disabilities, when they are receiving special education services, there's a couple of key differences between that, and that's what makes it tier three on steroids. One is that the, the resources are available to keep it going long term. So students might be receiving special education services for, for years, many years, and sustaining that funding is a big part of that. Um, there's additional legal protections for students receiving special education services, like when they're interacting with the discipline process, for example. Um, and then there's a, a, an enormous amount of power the school has to modify the student's experience of school, including curriculum, including um, really any, any element of their day can be modified with that legal power of special education. So it gives more tools in our toolbox to intensify and individualize and tailor what school looks like for that student in response to meeting their needs. And that, friends, is a brief look at Minnesota multi-tiered system of supports. And I'm just gonna pull back and end here. Just again, coming back to everything that I just said, when we're working at it and persisting at it is in service and support of teaching and learning students and educators. Thank you.